We all make mistakes. We've all experienced uh, failure. Uh, we all do things that are wrong. A woman writes, Dear Abby, and says, I'm 44 years old. I'd like to meet, meet a man my age with no bad habits. <laughs> she writes back, Dear Rose, so would I. <laughs> uh, you can't find somebody with no bad habits who never fails. In the sixth book of the Old Testament, uh, Joshua tells about a time he failed. Along with two million Israelites he brought into the land of Canaan. If you're a guest, let me catch you up. Uh, this is the fifth in a series of messages called Putting God's Power to Work in Your Life. Uh, the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Uh, uh, then God tapped Moses to lead them out of uh, Egypt and uh, God did many amazing miracles and finally Pharaoh let the people go. He promised to give them the land of Canaan as their inheritance so Moses sent 12 spies in to check out the land. Ten of them came back and said we can't do it. The cities are walled and uh, they have mighty warriors. And so God put the people of Israel because of their lack of faith in a 40 year time out wandering around uh, the wilderness until all the people of military age and older had died off. Uh, then he, uh, Moses died and he picked Joshua to lead the people across the Jordan River and into the land of Canaan as their inheritance. Uh, they came across the Jordan River, God split it and they walked through on dry ground. Then they defeated Jericho, a mighty double walled city. Uh, they were, had a string of victories. Their next mission was to take a smaller city, I, A-I, at the top of a ridge, a fortress second in value, uh, strategically only to Jericho. If they conquer I, the Israelites will hold the hill country, and from there they can expand their wedge across Canaan, moving to the north and then to the south. Uh, Jericho fell with ease. The second city stood before them. If you want to follow along in the Bibles, we have under the seats, it's going to be on page 218, Joshua chapter 7. Joshua 6 ended on a high note. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. A mighty Jericho had been burned to the ground. Uh, the word was out. The Israelites were a force. Joshua's face was on the evening news. Joshua was trending on Twitter. The seventh chapter of Joshua opens with an ominous but. The word but tells us something bad is about to happen. They're about to fail. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, Son of Zimri, son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah took some of them, so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Here was God's instruction to the people of Israel before they took Jericho. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go in to his treasury. The instructions were clear. Don't touch the stuff. Don't make necklaces of gold. Uh, don't make metals out of bronze. No souvenirs. No trinkets. No Jericho jewelry. No kidding. God had high hopes for the Hebrew people. Uh, through them, the Bible was going to be written. To them, the prophets were going to be sent. To them, his own son would come. God needed them to trust him. Rely on their own strength? No. Their own resources? No. Their own abilities? No. This is the message of the series, putting God's power to work in your life. Just as God's power was available to the Israelites... His power is available to us. Who opened the Jordan River? Who led the people across on dry ground? Who appeared to encourage Joshua? Who brought down the walls of Jericho? God. 
Even in the wilderness, they never went without provision. They may have grown weary of manna nut bread, but they were never hungry. He gave them not just food, but clothing and good health. Moses tells the Hebrews, your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. The following phrases were never heard in the wilderness. I need to soak my feet in Epsom salts. I need some blue amu or icy hot. I need, I have to buy some new fry boots. I really got to get a new Columbia sportswear ski jacket. Podiatrists, tailors, and cobblers had lots of time on their hands. No want for food, no need for clothing, never a blister or a bunion. God provided for them. They were to enter into the promised land trusting God. They were to enter the promised land believing God's power was available to work in their lives. What went wrong for Israel? They had the Ark of the Covenant, which assured them that God's presence was with them. They had the first five books of the Old Testament to guide them. They had God's promise that he was giving them the land of Canaan as their inheritance. Jericho had fallen easily. Why did they fail? I think the lesson we learn is not trusting God leads to failure. Trusting God brings blessing. By examining the reasons Israel failed, I think it can shed some light on reasons we fail. I find four reasons we fail. First, failure occurs when we become self-confident. When the people of Israel saw Jericho's walls topple like huge dominoes, they must have thought, surely all of Canaan will be just as simple. Verse 2 now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Haven, to the east of Bethel, and told them, Go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send just two or three thousand men to take it. Do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. Since we find no evidence that Israel prayed before attacking Ai, I think we can conclude that self-confidence crept in. The spies said, it's just a small city. Not that many people live there. Josh, just send, you know, two or 3,000 soldiers. This seems to be the spirit of the spies. There's no experience so full of danger as the flush of victory. When we've just seen grand success, we've been patted on the back for a job well done, we feel like we've got the world by the tail, we're in peril of being tripped up by sin. Solomon writes, a man's pride brings him low. Verse 4, so about 3,000 went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites? Amorites is the same as the Canaanites. To destroy us. If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say? Now that Israel has been routed by its enemies, the Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? Self-confidence caused them to fail. Second, failure occurs when we do not think through how our actions will affect others. Verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, stand up, what are you doing on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. God says it's not that the people of I are so formidable. It's that the people of Israel have been poisoned. God told Joshua, find the rotten apple before it... Uh, ruins the whole bushel. 
I will not be with you unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. God said, Israel has sinned. They have taken some of the devoted things. Now, what happened here? One man sinned. Stole property that God said was devoted to him. He said, don't touch the gold or silver or bronze or anything like that. All that's to go into the Lord's treasury. One individual in the camp betrayed God's trust, and the verdict was not Achan has sinned, but Israel has sinned. The most startling thing about this account is one man sinned, and the whole nation was punished. Thirty-six men were killed. So God told Joshua to go and eradicate the sin among the people. Go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord says. There are devoted things among you. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe the Lord chooses shall come forward clan by clan. The clan the Lord chooses shall come forward family by family. And the family the Lord chooses shall come forward man by man. Whoever is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire, along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing. Early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes, and Judah was taken. The clans of Judah came forward, and the Zerahites were chosen. He had the clan of Zerahites come forward by families, and Zimri was chosen. Joshua had his family come forward man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zimri, son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, was taken. So God points out the man who sinned. Now, it's interesting. Why didn't God just say, hey, go to Achan's tent and you'll, you'll find the problem? Why did he have all this drama coming forward tribe by tribe? I think he wanted to impress upon everybody, everybody examining, you know, is it me, God? Achan alerts us to a truth we need to hear. We think that what we do doesn't affect anyone else. We live in an age of hyper individualism in which we think what I do is my business what you do is your business so let's just mind our own business we think we can disobey God and it won't have any ill effect on our family our country or our church but there is no such thing as private sin we're told that pornography is no big deal it doesn't affect anybody else but study after study shows pornography has a negative impact on all our relationships. You drink and drive and cause an accident that takes someone's life. Your choice has affected somebody else. You have an affair and it devastates your mate and all your children. If one Christian grows cold in their spiritual life, it lowers the temperature of everybody else in the church because we are one body. The witness of our church is affected by the testimony of every one of us. I often refer to this as the Washington Square Church. Washington Square is just a mile down the road. Uh, often, Jory will take our girls uh, for lunch uh, at Nordstrom Cafe after the second service, and then they might do some shopping. Um, I always ask them what they got, and they, they always order the same thing. And uh, once in a while, I tag along. So suppose I come along with them, and we get there, and there's a line of like 40 people waiting to get into the cafe. And I say, this is no good. We're going to be here all day. I said, come with me, girls. And so I have them come up to the front where they have the, the menu, you know, in a rack, and, and we, I, I grab a menu, and I'm looking at it, and I just kind of just move my way into the front of the line. People in the back are rolling their eyes and hey, they have some choice words for me. And, but we get seated and we're eating our lunch and a guy stops at our table and he says, hey, I saw you today at, at Portland Community Church. Is that a good church? How do you think my testimony will go after all these people have seen what I did and they're so disgusted with me? I've just decreased the likelihood of 40 people coming to know Christ through this church. Third, failure occurs when we stop trusting God. Verse 19, then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord and honor him. Tell me what you've done. Do not hide it. 
Achan replied, it's true, I have sinned against the Lord. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent. It's not hard to recreate Achan's stumble. Along with the other soldiers, he walked into Jericho. The rubble was all around. The walls were down. All the uh, plunder was there laying open. The gold, the silver, the fine garments. Everyone saw the stuff. Everyone else remembered God's command and walked past it. But Achan, when he thought no one was looking, he paused, looked to the left, to the right. He thought, who will notice if I slip a little bit of silver and gold in my bag? I mean, there's all this stuff. Perhaps he wanted a payoff. Maybe wanted a nest egg. He saw a beautiful, new, stylish garment, just his size, from Babylon. Now, Babylon was one of the great cities of that day, great cultures. You wear garments from Babylon, and you are stylish. You're with it. What should this teach us? Do we struggle against the danger of stealing from God because we want a garment from Babylon? Does it teach us to beware the temptation of holding back in our giving to God because we're trying to keep up impressions with our neighbors? Whatever the explanation, Achan did not trust God to provide for him. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. Achan stole from God. He stole what was devoted to God, the first fruits. Achan stole from God, just as we might today, by promising to give to God the first tenth of our income, yet failing to do so. The irony for Achan is that he steals from Jericho, but in the next city, I, God reverses the command. He says, you've already given me the tithe from Jericho, so in I, you can take whatever you want. Achan stumbled because he was impatient. Had he waited and trusted God, he could have had all that he wanted. How many times do we miss out on God's watchful eye over our finances because we do not trust him to meet our needs if we give him the full tithe? Achan reminds us, don't put your trust in stuff. So imagine if you're living in the South during the Civil War. And through a series of battles, events, you come to realize the South is going to lose. And you've accumulated all this Confederate money. That money is soon going to be worthless. So what do you do? If you're smart, you'll convert all of it into the money of the North before it loses all of its value. Are you investing in the currency of heaven? Your wallet is full of soon-to-be worthless money. The currency of this world will be worth nothing when you die or when Christ returns, both which could happen any day. Fourth, failure occurs when we do not take sin seriously. Verse 24, Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan the son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold wedge, his sons and daughter, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Acre. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him, and after that they stoned the rest. They burned them. Over Achan they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. In Deuteronomy we read, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for his own sin. Children were not to be put to death for their parents' sins. So Achan's children were put to death, I can only conclude, because they were part of the cover-up. They were in on it with Dad. Why did Achan have to pay with his life? You read this story and you say, boy, isn't this kind of over-the-top, God? This was the dawn of a new era. 
God was bringing the Israelites into the promised land and established them as the people that would prepare the way for his son. They were driving out a people who for centuries had brazenly disobeyed God. God's people had to be different. They had to be pure. They had to learn that sin was not to be taken lightly. Now, the judgment of Achan was a turning point for the Israelites. They never lost another battle in taking Canaan. We who have put our trust in Christ are God's new people. Christ died so that we might no longer be slaves to sin. Yet many voices today will tell us that sin is no big deal. They believe that since we are saved by grace, it doesn't matter how we live. Just because God is gracious doesn't mean it doesn't matter how we live. A young man who claimed to be a Christian was badgering his Christian girlfriend into lowering her sexual standards. He says, come on. Everybody's doing it. And she responded to him wisely, well, if everybody's doing it, you shouldn't have any trouble, trouble finding another girl that will. May her tribe increase. When Jesus died on the cross, he defeated the power of sin in our lives. Louis Giglio, in his book, um, Goliath Must Fall, tells about being a counselor during his uh, camp counselor during his high school and college years in a camp outside of Atlanta. Uh, one of his uh, fellow counselors was Andy Stanley, who's the pastor of North Point Community Church in Atlanta. And uh, they had rattlesnakes at this camp, and so they put lime on the paths to the bathrooms, to, and that would keep the snakes away. But every once in a while, a camper would complain, that, hey, there's, there's snakes on the way to the bathrooms. So when the campers would leave and they have a, a, a transition day, they would go out and, 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 and kill the snakes. So the way they did it, they would go out at night. Snakes uh, come out when it cools. And uh, so they had a bat in one hand and a flashlight in the other, and they would wade through this ankle-high grass looking for these uh, uh, copperhead snakes. And uh, after a while, sure enough, they'd see one, like a three-foot copperhead cruising in front of them. I mean, this was not uber-sophisticated technique they were using. Uh, this is just low-level combat. Um, I mean, they just wore tennis shoes and, uh, you know, shorts. Uh, they didn't have, a sto you know, uh, steel-toed boots or, you know, leg protection or anything. Um, so they'd see one snake, and then they'd watch for another one. His brother might be close behind, and, and when they'd see it, they'd take their bat and bam, hit it over the head. And then just to make sure they'd gotten him, you know, be, they'd hit it again like 50 times, bam, 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 bam. Then when they were sure the snake was dead, they would um, take the, the neck of the bat and push it against his head and pull the tail and snap off the head. This is pretty fun stuff, huh? And, uh, and then they would grind it into the ground, you know, and put, put sand over it. And then what do they do after that? Well, they can't leave the rest of the snake there. And the camper come through and see that and freak out. And, and so they'd, they'd take the, the snake in their hand. So after about an hour, they're carrying about a dozen snakes in one hand and they're juggling the, the flashlight and the, and the bat in the other. Well, funny thing about snakes, when you kill them, the head may be off, but the snake's body still moves for quite a while. So they're walking around in the dark with a handful of snakes wrapped around their arm, moving. Golly. And, uh, and you know, they have to remind themselves, hey, I killed that snake. It's not alive. I buried its head in the ground. When you kill a snake, its body still moves. Uh, Jesus defeated sin, but sin still has power over our lives. Don't be surprised by sin's power in your life. But don't forget that Jesus died for sin and disarmed its power on the cross. Christ doesn't want you to live in defeat. He, he wants you to live out your new inheritance, 
recognizing that you have the power of the Holy Spirit living within you. That power is the same power he used when he raised Christ from the dead. Many of us have a casual attitude towards sin. It no longer makes us blush. It seldom brings us to tears. But if God takes sin so seriously that he sent his son to die for it, can we do any less? Achan did not take God's command seriously and did not trust God to provide for him. Can you trust God today? Not trusting God leads to failure. Trusting God brings blessing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this story. It's pretty powerful. First, first read through, we kind of think, God, aren't you, aren't you kind of over the top putting this guy and all his family to death? But we see that you take sin seriously and that our sin affects our family, our church, our country, people with whom we work, go to school. Lord, help us to have a whole new attitude of taking seriously what you take seriously. I want to give you time to talk to God right now. We've got our heads bowed. Would you just tell God maybe there's some sin going on in your life and you want to confess that and say, God, I can see that's going to affect other people, not just me. And I want to take it seriously like you do. Please forgive me and help me use your power, the power of the Holy Spirit available to me to overcome that. You pray right now. Lord God, thank you for these powerful stories you've included in your word to teach us how to live life now and to teach us who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.